Since the beginning of time, we have always looked for an advantage over our enemies, whether that be inventing new weapons or just improving old ones. In this video, we will be diving into some of the most revolutionary weapons mankind has ever invented, proving that there is no limit to our imagination when victory must be achieved at all costs. These are five weapons that changed warfare. Number 5. The Sarissa. The Sarissa was a long spear about 4 to 6 meters, or 13 to 20 feet in length. It was introduced by Philip II of Macedon and was used in his Macedonian phalanxes as a replacement for the earlier Dory spear, which was considerably shorter. These longer spears improved the strength of the phalanx formation by extending the rows of overlapping weapons projecting towards the enemy. The word Sarissa remained in use even throughout the Byzantine years, to sometimes describe the long spears of their own infantry. The Sarissa, made of tough and resilient cornel wood, was very heavy for a spear, weighing approximately 5 to 6 kilograms. It had a sharp iron head shaped like a leaf, and a bronze butt spike, which could be anchored in the ground to stop charges by the enemy. The spike was sharpened well enough to pierce an enemy shield and the bronze material of the butt spike prevented it from rusting. The spike also served to balance out the spear, making it easier for soldiers to wield, and could be used as a backup point should the main one be lost in battle. The sheer bulk and size of the spear required the soldiers to wield it with both hands, allowing them to carry a 60cm or 24-inch shield, suspended from the neck to cover the left shoulder. Its great length was an asset against other hoplites and soldiers bearing shorter weapons, as they had to get past the sarissas to engage the Macedonian phalanx. However, outside the tight formation of the phalanx, the sarissa was of limited utility as a weapon and a hindrance on the march. As such, it was usually composed of two parts and was joined by a central bronze tube, these two parts were carried on the soldier's back during these marches. Complicated training ensured that the Macedonian troops wielded their sarissa in unison. The phalanx would usually march to battle in open formation to facilitate movement, and before the charge, it would tighten its ranks to a compact formation. This formation created a deadly wall of pikes, the spear being so long that there were fully five rows of them projecting in front of the first rank of men, even if an enemy got past the first row, there were still four more rows to stop them. The back rows bore their pikes angled upwards in readiness, which served the additional purpose of deflecting incoming arrows, as a result, the Macedonian phalanx was considered invulnerable from the front, except for if it was pit against another phalanx. The only way it was generally defeated was by finding a way of breaking its formation or outflanking it. The Sarissa was so effective that it remained the core of Hellenistic, and especially Diadochi armies for hundreds of years. Number 4. The Hand Cannon. The Hand Cannon is the oldest type of small arms, as well as the most mechanically simple. Unlike matchlock firearms it requires direct manual ignition through a touch hole without any form of firing mechanism. It was essentially just a smaller handheld cannon, identical in function to the larger cannon used on military ships of the line in the 17th century. Very early versions of the hand cannon were widely used in China from the 13th century onward, and later saw further development throughout Eurasia in the 14th century. In 15th century Europe, the hand cannon evolved to become the matchlock, which became the first firearm in history to have a trigger. The first recorded use of gunpowder weapons in Europe was in 1331, and by 1338, hand cannons were in widespread use in Europe. It was a rather primitive contraption, consisting of a barrel, a handle, and sometimes a socket to insert a wooden stock. The weapon could be held in two hands, with another person often being shown aiding in the ignition process using smoldering wood, coal, red-hot iron rods, or slow-burning matches. For solo use the hand cannon could be placed on a rest and held by one hand, while the gunner applied the means of ignition on his own. Modern tests have been conducted using period-accurate mixes of gunpowder, firing both arrows and lead balls. The velocities of the arrows varied from 63 to 87 meters a second, with max ranges of 350 meters, while the lead balls achieved velocities of between 110 to 142, with an average range of 630 meters. The rapid spread of the early hand cannon was heavily attributed to its use by the Mongol hordes, bringing the weapon from Asia as they moved in overwhelming numbers conquering most of Eurasia, pillaging and raping, leaving its people devastated, and having to rebuild, all while paying large tributes of gold and livestock to their aggressors once they left. 
This led the people of Europe to unite and form defensive alliances, in an attempt to stop the Horde from ravaging their lands. By the mid-14th century the grip of the Golden Horde over Central and Eastern Europe had started to weaken. Several European kingdoms started various incursions into Mongol-controlled lands, with the aim of reclaiming captured territories as well as claiming new ones from the Mongol Empire itself. After enduring such a bloody ordeal for decades, the dust was allowed to settle, and the Islamic and Christian world would now pave the way for further tactical and technological development of the hand cannon, and change warfare forever. Number 3. Combat Aircraft Prior to the First World War, military tactics placed an emphasis on open warfare and individual riflemen, this proved obsolete however, when in 1914 the world was confronted with the Great War, and the realities of trench warfare. Technological advances allowed the creation of strong defensive systems largely impervious to massed infantry advances, such as barbed wire, machine guns and far more powerful artillery, which dominated the battlefield and made crossing open ground extremely difficult, even for small scouting formations. Both sides struggled to develop tactics for breaching entrenched positions without suffering heavy casualties. In time however, developments in technology began to produce new offensive weapons, as well as providing upgrades for old ones. The use of aircraft in warfare was not a new idea by the time of the First World War, as the first use of an airplane in war was on October 23, 1911, during the Italo-Turkish War, when an Italian pilot made a one-hour reconnaissance flight over enemy positions near Tripoli, Libya, in a Blériot monoplane, a French aircraft of the pioneer era of aviation. So with it being almost impossible to reliably scout enemy trench systems, it would only be a matter of time before airplanes would be put to use again. Initially they were just used for reconnaissance, with newer models being developed with more powerful engines to achieve higher altitude and faster speeds. It wasn't long before we would see aircraft armed, in order to combat enemy planes, and then having their extra reconnaissance equipment replaced with explosives for strategic bombing raids. Turning the skies above the battlefields of the Great War into perhaps the most dynamic and fluid part of the conflict. Military aviation came into its own during the Second World War. The increased performance, range, and payload of contemporary aircraft meant that air power could move beyond the novelty applications of World War I, becoming a central striking force for all the combatant nations. Over the course of the war, several distinct roles emerged for the application of air power, and specialized aircraft were developed. Air power was now such an important component to modern warfare, that if air superiority was achieved by one side, it was often considered the beginning of the end for the other. Number 2. The Tank Following the difficulties faced by troops in assaulting and taking enemy fortified trenches in 1914, a meeting took place in 1915 at the Allied Interdepartmental Conference. Its purpose was to discuss the progress of the plans for what were described as Caterpillar machine gun destroyers, or land cruisers. As a result, the First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, formed the Landship Committee, on 20 February 1915. So many played a part in its long and complicated development, that it is not possible to name any individual as the sole inventor of the tank. On the 22nd of July 1915, a commission was placed to design a machine that could cross a trench four feet wide. In January 1916 the prototype, nicknamed Mother, was adopted as the design for future machines, with the first order for the tanks being placed on 12 February 1916, and a second on 21 April that same year. And after what would prove to be a very revolutionary endeavor, the Mark I tank was now a reality. With a total crew of eight men, an armament of two six-pounder guns, three Hotchkiss machine guns, and weighing in at 31 tons at full combat load, this behemoth was the first of its kind to ever see the front lines of war. A small number of Mark I tanks took part in the Battle of the Somme in September 1916, they were used to cut through barbed wire in order to clear the way for infantry, and were even driven through houses to destroy machine gun emplacements. Although many broke down or became stuck, Almost a third that attack made it across no man's land, and their effect on the enemy was noted, leading to a request by the British commander Sir Douglas Haig for a thousand more. British tanks were used with varying success in the offensives of 1917 on the Western Front, however their first large-scale use in a combined operation was at the Battle of Cambrai in November 1917, nearly 400 tanks working closely with advancing infantry and supported by a creeping barrage, overran the German lines in the initial attack. 
During the Battle of Amiens in August 1918, several hundred Mark V tanks, along with the brand new Whippet tanks, penetrated the German lines, in what would be a great foreshadowing of how modern warfare would look with these giant armored behemoths charging the battlefield. Number 1. The Aircraft Carrier. On the 9th of May 1912, the first takeoff of an airplane from a ship while underway was made by Commander Charles Sampson, flying a short modified S-27 biplane from the deck of the Royal Navy's battleship the HMS Hibernia. Thus providing the first practical demonstration of the aircraft carrier for naval operations at sea. Early in World War I, the Imperial Japanese Navy ship, the Wakamaya, conducted the world's first successful ship-launched air attack on 6 September 1914, a Farman aircraft successfully launched and attacked the Austro-Hungarian cruiser SMS Kaiserin Elizabeth and an Imperial German gunboat in Kauchau Bay. The first successful carrier-specific launched airstrike was the raid on Tondern in July 1918. Seven Sopwith Camels were launched from the battlecruiser HMS Furious which had been modified to incorporate a flight deck and hangar by removing its forward turret. The Camels attacked and damaged the German airbase at Tondern that was being used to house Zeppelin, and destroyed two of the giant airships. Although only seeing limited use in its pioneering years of World War I, the aircraft carrier dramatically changed naval combat in World War II, with air power becoming a significant factor in warfare. The development of aircraft as focal weapons was driven by the superior range, flexibility, and effectiveness of carrier-launched aircraft. They had greater range and precision than naval guns, making them highly effective. The versatility of the carrier was demonstrated in November 1940, when HMS Illustrious launched a long-range strike on the Italian fleet at their base in Taranto. This operation in the shallow water harbor, incapacitated three of the six anchored battleships at a cost of only two torpedo bombers. The Japanese surprise attack on the American Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor on Sunday 7 December 1941, was an even clearer illustration of the ship's power and capability. Using a large force of modern carriers, concentrating six in a single fleet, the raid was widely considered an astounding success, and for a time left the American Pacific Fleet crippled. The attack shocked the world, as no other nation had fielded anything comparable at the time. Modern navies that operated aircraft carriers started to treat them as the capital ship of the fleet, a role earlier held by the sailing galleons, frigates, ships of the line, and later steam or diesel-powered battleships. Being able to dispense such a large amount of precision firepower at such a long range was quickly turning the massive battleships of old, obsolete, as the battleship would need to put their own vessel in the firing line to achieve the same damage with less accuracy, risking tons of valuable munitions and equipment, as well as hundreds of lives. Following the Second World War, carrier operations continued to increase in size and importance, as well as carrier designs also increasing in scale and ability. Some of these larger carriers, sometimes called supercarriers, displace up to 75,000 tons or more, and have become the pinnacle of carrier development, changing naval combat forever. That was 5 weapons that changed warfare. Thanks for watching, and please click the subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this one.